Uh, hey guys, come on in, get comfortable. Uh, we're here to entertain you for an hour. A um, couple quick rules. Uh, one, there are no rules. Two, if you have a question about the first rule, or if you have a question, see rule one. Um, second, if you're easily offended, um, you might want to leave because Haney's just be ornery today. Um, and Larry might be ornery too. Um, he's tweeting about it right now. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, um, we're going to start at the opposite end, Larry. We're going to let you uh, uh, give her a, a quick bio. Um, this is an interactive panel. My view of this process is we're here to be of service to you. So if you have questions, you want to call bullshit, um, whatever, during the process, stick your hand up and we will uh, stop and try to address uh, your question on the fly as opposed to um, later. So we're, we're here to really try to be helpful to you if we can be. Um, and I'm going to see with a few questions, but uh, then we're going to open it up quickly. Okay, Larry, it's up to you, baby. Take us home. Hi, uh, Larry Marcus, Walden Venture Capital. We do sprout stage investing, so it's not seed stage. We want to see that you've actually developed something, want to really see that product. It starts with the demo and want to feel that excitement either directly or in whatever your target market is. Um, but really like the music space because it's a great passion center. Um, people spend a lot of time with it and it leads to a lot of other really interesting, exciting commerce and interactions. Um, the companies in and around the music space uh, that I've done are uh, Pandora, Soundhound, uh, Bandpage, and my most recent deal is uh, Boombotics, maker of the Boombot speaker. They're in the main room, and they're cute little social, portable, ultra-portable speakers. Um, that's us. Hi, I'm Louis Gersh with Metamorphic Ventures, a recovering entrepreneur as well as attorney. Uh, first job was with UMG at its founding when they bought Rising Tide Entertainment uh, to form it and then quickly turned left into a partnership with AOL to launch a digital media company and never looked back. After a soulmate company started Metamorphic Ventures uh, with two partners, we do seed stage uh, the, and the, the stage before what he was talking about. So we're kind of you know two or three people, a PowerPoint and a dog. Um, sometimes they don't have a PowerPoint. And we help develop them up, lead the round, get the product live in market, generally get monetization going, usually for a handful of customers, million bucks or two run rate. We focus on digital media services and digital commerce services. Our strategy is what we call transactional media, and it's really leveraging the rising tides of both and it encompasses desktop, mobile, and very specifically also oftentimes connecting to the physical world and retail. I'm Pat Keneally with IDG Ventures. Um, IDG is a big uh, media company. We see the music business as, as uh, any other uh, media business. We invest in Series A companies, a little bit later stage than the two guys to my left. We've uh, been investing in music businesses since the late 1990s in companies like um, Spinner.com, uh, Shazam, and the hardware side in companies like Olive Media Systems, and in services like Bandpage and TuneUp. So we're active music investors um, and looking for new deals. Hi, <clears throat> whoa, wrong pitch. Uh, <laughs> hi everybody, my name is Haney Nada. I am a partner at a firm called GGB Capital. We're here in the Bay Area. Uh, we have about a uh, billion six under management, so we tend to invest in later stage companies, so B to D rounds. We typically invest in between five and $25 million in portfolio, in portfolio companies. Uh, I focus on the media side, so content creation, content distribution, content uh, monetization. Uh, invest in companies like uh, Pandora after Larry, SoundCloud, Bandpage. We also have a large office in China. We're, we're in two companies in China, the media space, YY and Tudo. Uh, Tudo is very similar to YouTube here, very, very big platform in China. And I've uh, been actively looking at the music space, music industry, because I think it's uh, actually a fantastic opportunity right now. Uh, and I'm Mark Montgomery, I'm your last minute moderator. I'm also going to participate a little bit. I'm the founder of a uh, company called Flow Thinkery, which is uh, a think tank based in Nashville, Tennessee, which actually does have venture investing and uh, uh, very um, much. Uh, of the, the core focus of the entire city really is music. Um, 
And so um, I uh, was also, I'm also a recovering entrepreneur, um, built a company, sold it, um, bootstrapped it, bank financed it, venture financed it, exited it, became an EVP, unwound it, all that shit. It was really fun. Um, and uh, uh, I, took a, I took a little right turn, went to work for a venture firm, um, thought, discovered I, there was a hole in that business, and uh, certainly not these guys, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of them are operating on a, an interesting model that might have some opportunity for reboot, um, and I'm building a, a company around that. Uh, we're nine months old, and uh, I'm pretty happy with where we are. So I'm a little bit of a wacko uh, in all this. Um, what I'd like to do is is to talk a little bit. We had a we had a little discussion beforehand. Although, uh, as Brian just said, oh, the venture guys will be late. They think they know everything. So um, the uh, what I'd like to do is to to talk a little bit about um, the this idea of the music industry really being kind of a bad business model, and uh, how how can how does that get made good? And because uh, Haney's ornery and it was his idea, we're going to let him talk about it first. Okay, uh, uh, raise your hands, get you guys involved here. Uh, how many people watch sports on TV? Nearly everybody in the room. How many people listen to music in this room? Uh, nearly everybody in this room. What do you value more, music or sports? Music. Oh, interesting. So here's some stats for you guys. This is directly from the government. The average American spends 14 hours a week listening to music. Take a wild guess what the average American does in, for sports. Three and a half hours. That's per week. Three and a half hours of sports, 14 hours of music. Take a wild guess how big the sports industry is. Almost $500 billion. How big is the music industry? Worldwide, it's $70 billion. What the fuck? What are you guys doing? What are you, what are you guys doing? We have 5x more engagement than the sports industry, yet we can't get our fans to pay for our stuff? That's fucked up. That's really fucked up. And it's your fault. It's you your right. fault. I, this is the music industry. It's all, all our fault. How do we... We have people that are engaged with us, yet we cannot monetize. And we're talking about pennies because we recorded music. The, the new stadium, San Francisco uh, Stadium is coming up, right? The 49er Stadium. $150,000 to $250,000 license per seat. People are paying that. And then a thousand dollars per ticket on top of that. That's a super fan. That's called a whale. Do you guys know what a whale is? Yep. Mm -hmm. Go find them. Figure out business models to find them. There, I'm done. <laughs> Any of the rest of you guys want to jump into that one? <laughs> You're right. You were feeling ornery. I guess I feel like a pussy cat now. <laughs> hey, was that five hundred billion? Did you say it's that? almost 441 billion. Okay. In 2011. Interesting. Okay. Uh, seriously, anybody else want to comment on that? I would also add that you know, whining is a long-term you know uh, art form in the music business. And, uh, you know, when Gutenberg first started printing sheet music, it was oh my god, the business is going to hell. And then piano rolls, oh my god, the business is going to hell. And then tubular records and flat records and you know, magnetic tape and tape cassettes and CD-ROMs, it's always something in the music business. And those of you who think you're disrupting the biggest disruption ever should realize that, you know, the suits at the record labels and at the stereo companies and whatever have been dealing with this for 300 years. Well, one thing I want to add to that is, is when you look at the, the, that transition in the Gutenberg revolution to the internet revolution, uh, the first attempt to protect intellectual property that was printed on a page from the time that the press was instituted was 300 years later. Right. So uh, uh, standards always lag. Everybody's always worried about the standard. How do we how do we protect our property? The the, the reality is is the market inevitably just determines how to protect it. Um, and fighting the market, legislation and litigation of market share is a really crappy business strategy. Just ask U.S. steel companies how that worked out for them. Um, there's tons of opportunity in all of that disruption, to your point. But the question is, is where to go? So to that end, and I'm going to throw this down to Larry, describe the abstract layers uh, of the music business in, in terms of services. And where are the... Where are the 
the, the, you, you made this comment, there's a lot of white noise still left. There's a lot of, a lot of places to go and, and develop products. Can you talk about that? Sure, I mean, the music industry, when people usually think about it, they just think about somebody buying a CD or buying a track. But if you actually go back more to where Haney's coming at it from, which is the time spent around it, it's actually even greater than the 14 hours because it starts all the way on education and kids loving to play instruments and all of that passion, all of the creation, all of the gear around creation. That whole part of the market is going to change dramatically. I mean, why isn't every single piece of musical gear going to be controlled by an iPad that's connected to a CPU and the device? Just think of that extra power. Why isn't all of that going to be networked? Um, the discovery aspect of it. There's more and more stuff, yet it's actually harder and harder to find something that's actually good. And that's you know, that whole discovery curation layer. I mean, that's part of why you know radio um, has been working so well. But there's also search. You know, how do you actually find it? You know, why is uh, you know even Google search and music is very broken. Um, you know, that's why you have all of these really interesting blossoming apps. And then consumption is really shifting as well. I mean, look at the money spent on the audiophile market. I mean, look at what people spend on cabling uh, to attach their stereos. You know, people spending an extra hundred dollars on a cable because somebody tells them it sounds better. Um, everything from the low end speaker market to the high end speaker market to all of the gear uh, surrounding it. Again, another really big piece. And then, of course, there's the whole band desire. I mean, my daughter plays in a band, and they are basically doing the exact same reason that everybody does it, which is you just love music, and then you want to play, and you want to have a gig. And nobody wants to monkey around with all the technology. If you're an artist, and you want to be an artist and you want to have the venues filled, and you want to be discovered, and you don't want to deal with any of the other stuff, that whole part of the ecosystem is really broken. And live music is incredibly broken. If you want to go see a show, how do you actually know where to go? Um, once you're at the show, the bands are still you know, trying to throw paper at you. There's just a, a ton of stuff going on, and I think the unit uh, the music as unit of exchange is becoming a smaller and smaller piece, and I, I don't like the transition of songs uh, from albums. I loved albums. I'm, I still have vinyl, though I haven't had a player in a long time, but I look at them and I long for them. <laughs> just not very convenient. But um, that's happened. Songs are the unit of consumption. It's a 90% it's a pay check cut right there. So I think it's really about all of this other stuff, the infrastructure uh, and the services, the creation, and, and on and on. Um, just out of curiosity, how many in the room are entrepreneurs looking for money? Uh-oh. Boys are going to get mobbed after. Um, how many of you are, te are, are pure techs, my favorite? The musicians of uh, the coder world. Uh, and then how many of you are, are artists? So that's our audience, boys. Um, I want to talk about to that to your to that point, Larry. And one thing, if if uh, as we go, um, I try to keep these in big buckets. So, could you go back and give the bullets of the four or five areas you just described that you think are ripe that have lots of white space opportunity? Well, that was you know education, uh, creation, um, discovery, consumption, and and I think band. You know, is remaining wide open. And, you know, band services. Yeah, and live music. Band services live. Yeah. Okay. Any of you guys want to add to that or or challenge that before we move on? I, I just asked Larry when he was looking at his records. Are you really just reading the liner notes? <laughs> are you looking at what's on the cover? I think seriously, the the points. Well, the album art actually is amazing. Better. And rock, I love rock posters. And, and that art is gone. I mean, for a great part. I think we look at it and we said, in in that in the music industry you have, it is one where there's an incredible history of an installed infrastructure and a lot of times we see the seed level entrepreneurs coming forward and saying uh, we can bust that infrastructure, it doesn't have to be there. 
and and probably one of the biggest risks as we're looking at that is what can be busted and what is entrenched that you kind of want to ride on the rails that are there or you're not going to really displace them. Um, we have the same thing in payments and we call it, you know, when the entrepreneur is doing it, we call it waterboarding Aquaman, right? <laughs> you you want to go torture them, they're actually going to enjoy it. You're going to make more money at the end of the day anyway, so embrace them as your friend. Figure out a way to work with them um, and, and leverage what they have for distribution or revenue already. Um, there is a lot that's broken. There's a lot that's there that you can you can draft off of and make them your friend. And, and Larry, just to be clear, uh, most people get in bands to get chicks. Just <laughs> you're kidding yourself if you think it's anything else. What, what do I tell my daughter now? Well, <laughs> or dudes, or dogs. Um, can we talk a little I bit mean, about? I think that 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 does. <laughs> That does give you a fifth thing, yeah. which is if you have distribution, you know, com uh, consumption, creation, education, compensation <laughs> is an area that it needs to be fixed for a lot of this to work. Yeah, agreed. Um, so one of the comments that got made, and I, I totally agree with this, it, it amazes me, and I even even today just overhearing the pitches in the hall, it, it, it's it's sort of you know classic comedy. Um, this idea of how many people are starting the same exact business, it's just got a different name. You know, it's like uh, Pinterest uh, mashed up with Facebook and iTunes. I, I think I heard that 20 times today, just walking by people. Um, so, uh, uh, you want to comment a little bit about the, the concept of homework? Um, uh, you made this you, uh, this commentary that the business has been around a long damn time, and it seemed to you that it would be not a bad idea to actually figure out how it works before you try to build a business. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, in terms of your your how, how hard it is to get to see you, um, how important it would be that you actually came with an idea that mattered. Any of you guys can talk about that. Well, our our doors are always open. We see on the on the order of a thousand uh, companies a year in our conference rooms, and you know to to break through that clutter, you need. Yeah, an interesting idea, and you need to, to demonstrate to the to the group whose time is finite that there's been some homework done. And the, the the thing I generalize about music entrepreneurs is that much more than let's say tech entrepreneurs, they don't know some of their own history, and some ideas that have not worked six or seven times before um, you know, end up on paper in our stack in a way that would never happen in the enterprise IT market or the telecom market um, or, or whatever. So you know, the, the, the high concept of, of what people are doing does matter because the, the demands on our attention are really large. It, it's, it's telling because some of the great ideas are actually have been done before. Like when YouTube came along, there was like 50 companies that were like that, it's just they nailed the subtlety at their initial acquisition. So it's kind of a weird fine balance too. So one of the things I think you guys may have caught in my opening conversation, or talk if you will, monologue, monologue, I'll call it my monologue, um, rant, is, you know, we see a lot of ideas. So there's, there's a, about going after market. And there's two types of market. There's the market where you're going to go after an existing market and just take away share because your product is cheaper, better, faster. Frankly, for us, especially in the music space, that's not that interesting. If all you're doing is you want to move record sales or album sales or digital download sales from one place to another, that's not that interesting. Because that, that's a really hard business, competitive business, and frankly, the margins aren't there. If you're just trying to do better merch, if you're trying to do better ticketing, that's not interesting. What I'm really interested in is taking a, figuring out a way to get that $70 billion to a $440 billion market. And that's, those are new revenue streams. And so if you're coming to pitch a new revenue stream for artists, for music, that sounds great. And I tell you, one of the areas that I'm most focused on is the concept of the fan and the super fans and the whales and the minnows and the dolphins. That to me is where I think a lot of the money, the untapped money is. I'm a super fan or a whale in the music business. I love going to live shows. I love listening to fresh music. I love meeting artists. I also play a lot of video games. And I've been known to spend hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars, on video games every year. How much do I spend on music? A fraction of that. Why? Because it isn't an opportunity for me to spend that. Figure that, out, figure that market out. There's a lot of people like me out there. I'm sure some of you guys are in the same boat. That's, I think, where the big opportunity is, where the billion dollar company is. When you're starting a company, there's two ways to think about it. It's either going to be a billion dollar business, 
or if it's gonna be then or it's gonna be a lifestyle business. If it's a lifestyle business, don't take any money from us. We're the devil, we're the stuff shoots. Do not do that because that's gonna get in the way of your lifestyle business. But if you're truly building a billion dollar outcome, think about it. You're gonna come pitch me and you're gonna say, I have a billion dollar idea, and here's my idea. That to us is that to me is interesting. But if you're just gonna build a business that's gonna generate twenty million dollars in revenue and have five percent net margins, that's a great business to buy a house and have a nice little family and maybe a lot of parties. But unless it's a billion dollar idea, it's hard to take venture capital dollars, especially in the scale that we're talking about, the 20, 20, you know, 15 to 20 million dollars. So that, that's kind of something to think about when you're starting a company or your existing company. Do you really want to take venture capital dollars? Because we're going to put you on a different trajectory where it's a, either going to be a one or a zero. Well, and so to that end, how many of our panelists, Larry, you're already raising your hand because I already know you're in this deal, um, are in Bandpage? Mm. Three out of five. Uh, so uh, what is, talk about your vision for that. So, so you don't put money in something unless you think it's a billion dollar company. What is that company? It's a simple, simple, simple message. Fan and band. Engagement. That's it. How do you engage with your fans? It's as simple as that. Yeah, when, when somebody brings that kind of an idea to a group and can back it up, you know, with five subsequent slides, not a song and dance, but just with some very basic data, it gets very, very quiet in the venture capital conference room. I use the example of Shazam. When people came and said, you hold up your phone, it tells you what song it is. They had us right there. That could be very large. Mm -hmm. Larry? I like it. <laughs> He's in. He's so so let me let me ask another question, and, and this is this is just from my own knowledge. So, um, Bandpage was built on really built on another platform initially, in, in the form of Facebook. Um, and I don't know you know what your view or disposition towards Facebook is, but it, uh, uh, my view is is that building on the back of somebody else's platform can be dangerous. Can you talk a little bit about what what that strategy was around? We're going to launch here, but we're actually going to migrate. And you look at the, the current state of the business, it's significantly different than it was. Sure. Talk about that and how you guys are involved in that. Sure. Well, look, Facebook has been the fastest growing social network and platform. And it was a really obvious place to, to just kind of be where the fans were. And that's where, where FanPage was initially built. They obviously have not had a lot of third-party value built in that ecosystem, which is kind of a separate problem that Facebook has because it's not as stable of a platform. They're always changing things, and they don't have an active, um, you know, platform and ecosystem for those third parties. So the company wanted to diversify away from it. The plans were in place, and we think that actually it was a great focusing event to really dig deeper on engagement and other factors. I think if that kind of thing actually happened later, and what I'm talking about is Facebook moved all pages to timeline, so if you went to a band or a brand, no one could actually uh, go in and customize that experience. Haney was actually in a company uh, called Buddy Media that did the same thing for brands and had a great exit you know, right around that time. And this was a... <laughs> Got and, here, didn't it? <laughs> and it was a big shift in the music traffic on Facebook is actually way down from that point. And the bands are reminded yet again how important it is to kind of be cross-platform and that's part of the, the band paid value proposition. So I think if this kind of thing happened later on in a company's history, it actually could have been a company killing event instead of it was a company focusing event. And Many of you have been through companies uh, from you know birth through exit. You know it's a very nonlinear experience across the board, no matter what the company is, and these sort of things happen. It's how you you know also adapt, adapt, and react. Um, just a word of advice to the folks in the room who are artists, um, and I mean no disrespect to my brethren here. But these guys, nor Facebook, nor any of the large scale platforms, give a fuck about you or your community. What they care about is monetizing their businesses. So always make sure that you understand that you need to go where the fans are. You'd be a fool not to. But you need to own the data sets. You need to control your own destiny if you're an artist. 
and you need to be able to pull your own information out and move yourself around. Um, I, by the way, I have an idea to pitch you. You talk about the uh, the whales. I, I know how to I know how to monetize those bad boys. Um, so uh, I just I want to strongly disagree with that. Okay. I, mean, I think that the the whole point is to actually empower bands to own their online presence. And, well, I'll give you and to help and to help them make money. At the end of the day, it's all about empowering revenue streams and lifestyle for the bands, and by doing so, that's the best way that relationship grows. It's a ultimately a value exchange. Well, so I, I don't disagree with that, but what I guess my point is is that when um, the, that business falls into the hands of somebody, remember a little company called iLike um, that had built a really cool thing? And then it got sure. upended and destroyed. I've had my space pages for my bands, and I like paid. I've had yeah. all of these different things, and that's part of the learnings and what people know, which is why you want to be first of all have your own website. That's my you that's my point. That's right. right. Have have your own dot com. And that's part of the beauty of the platform. You can set up and manage your right. online presence from one place, also including your own website and other right. places. So I, I want to. I mean. Um, I don't want to just sound like a money grubbing VC zealot, but you're about to. But no, but look, mu music is an art form, and I, I respect that. I mean, there's only a handful of VCs on the planet that invest in the music space, by the way, because they all think it's a bad business and they all want to wait. The reason why I want to invest in music is because I actually like the art form. I just think it's way under monetized, and you know, I take a lot of my experiences from my previous, from previous others, other industries. Um, and I think I talked last year about it, the gaming space, where there's a casual game online that's kind of a war uh, uh, over water, warship game. And a guy spent $76,000 to build his base in a span of over three months. Holy shit, $76,000 on a base, a virtual base with little army men right, running on the screen, not even physical, right? $76,000. That's a super fan. The CEO calls him up, hey, are you okay? You spent a lot of money on this. Is this for real? He's like, yeah, I love this. This is great. All my friends are really, really envious of my base, and I could kick anyone's ass. <laughs> Fast forward a year later, another guy just spent $136,000 in the same game. <laughs> and these guys are, this is their hobby, this is their life, this is what they want to do, this is what they like to do. I don't feel bad for them. That's great. If they want to do that, they know the whole thing. Everything is transparent. How you spend money, how you make money, and so on. That's transparent. How many fans, you as, you as an artist, the artist out there, are you able to say, you know, this, this super fan likes me and he spent, he gave me $136,000 for my artwork. Painters do that all the time. Why can't you do that? You have a question? Yeah, so I, I had a question, and it, it comes down to like, from Mary Meeker to like, oh, hold on a second, yeah. we gotta, we, we're recording this, unfortunately, yeah. for all of us. Sorry. <laughs> so, on that, on the back of that, from Mary Meeker to Pandora, one of the business models that's been kind of that VCs have been so, harping on for so long has been an ad-supported model, right? And the kind of the concept of display advertising for, in terms of content monetization, specifically speaking for demand gen platforms within blogs or within that, so that's sort of the aspect of the in industry, not necessarily from the artist industry. Um, the concept of trying to build a business for music blogs or whatever that is on 0.1% engagement rates just seems fundamentally wrong to me. And in terms of monetizing content, what do you guys see as the pathway to building a demand gen platform, i.e. a blog, to a level that it becomes a sustainable business? As in response to that. You must be a journalist. I, I write for Forbes, Quora, and I do BD for Simple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's an awesome uh, talk going on next door that I wish I was at. It's about crowdfunding and some of the examples that have happened in crowdfunding and how much money has been raised by artists from crowds. That's just one example that we've seen. And there's a lot of innovation. I'm not, we're not, I'm not smart enough to figure out what that model is. But there's examples that are coming up, that are showing up, that are fantastic examples. People sp willing to spend, I uh, forgot, Amanda Lambert, $25,000 for a concert in their backyard or a, a guitar show in their living room. People, there are crazy people out there with that kind of money that are willing to do that for artists. Go and find I, them. And I think also that, that in media businesses, 
business models come around and come back again. So it's not that there's some future one that we haven't picked. I, I, the example that you know, really jumps out at people is, in the 1950s, nobody paid for television. It was an ad-supported medium. Today, virtually all Americans pay a cable bill. It's a subscription-funded medium. So you can have one to the other and back again, and then a mix and whatever in, in these things. So there's, there's not a magic one thing. And if you talk about writing about music content, the, 